Book One of the Spirit of the Laws. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Benjamin Giddens. The Spirit of the Laws by Charles de Second, Baron de Montesquieu. Translated by Thomas Nugent. Book One of Laws in General. Chapter One of the Relation of Laws to Different Beings. Laws, in their most general signification, are the necessary relations arising from the nature of things. In this sense, all beings have their laws, the deity his laws, the material world its laws, the intelligence is superior to man and their laws, the beast their laws, and man his laws. They who assert that a blind fatality produced the various effects we behold in this world talk very absurdly for can anything be more unreasonable than to pretend that a blind fatality could be productive of intelligence beings there is then a prime reason and laws of the relations subsisting between it and different beings and the relation of those to one another god is related to the universe as creator and preserver the laws by which he created all things are those by which he preserves them he acts according to these rules because he knows them he knows them because he made them and he made them because they are in relation to his wisdom and power since we observe that the world though formed by the motion of matter and void of understanding subsists so long a succession of ages its motions must certainly be directed by invariable laws and could we imagine another world it must also have constant rules or it would inevitably perish thus the creation which seems an arbitrary act supposes laws as invariable as those of the fatality of the atheists it would be absurd to say that the creator might govern the world without those rules since without them it could not subsist these rules are a fixed and invariable relation in bodies moved the motion is received increased diminished or lost according to the relations of the quantity of matter and velocity each diversity is uniformity each change is constancy particular intelligent beings may have laws of their own making but they had some likewise which they never made before there were intelligent beings they were possible they had therefore possible relations and consequently possible laws before laws were made there were relations of possible justice to say that there is nothing just or unjust but what is commanded or forbidden by positive laws is the same as saying that before the describing of a circle all the radii were not equal we must therefore acknowledge relations of justice antecedent to the positive law by which they are established as for instance if human societies existed it would be right to conform to their laws if there were intelligent beings that had received a benefit of another being they ought to show their gratitude if one intelligent being had created another intelligent being the latter ought to continue in its original state of dependence if one intelligent being injures another it deserves a retaliation and so on but the intelligent world is far from being so well governed as the physical for though the former has also its laws which are of their own nature and are invariable it does not conform to them so exactly as the physical world this is because on the one hand particular intelligent beings are of a finite nature and consequently liable to error and on the other hand their nature requires them to be free agents hence they do not steadily conform to their primitive laws and even those of their own instituting they frequently infringe whether brutes be governed by the general laws of motion or by a particular movement we cannot determine be that as it may they have not a more intimate relation to god than the rest of the material world and sensation is of no other use to them in the relation they have either to other particular beings or to themselves by the allurement of pleasure they preserve the individual and by the same allurement they preserve their species they have natural laws because they are united by sensation positive laws they have none because they are not connected by knowledge and yet they do not invariably conform to their natural laws these are better observed by vegetables that have neither understanding nor sense 
Brutes are deprived of the high advantages which we have, but they have some which we have not. They have not our hopes, but they are without our fears. They are subject like us to death, but without knowing it. Even most of them are more attentive than we to self-preservation, and do not make so bad a use of their passions. Man, as a physical being, is like other bodies governed by invariable laws. As an intelligent being, he incessantly transgresses the laws established by God, and changes those of his own instituting. He is left to his private direction, though a limited being and subject, like all finite intelligences, to ignorance and error. Even his imperfect knowledge he loses, and as a sensible creature, he is hurried away by a thousand impetuous passions. Such a being might every instant forget his creator. God has therefore reminded him of his duty by the laws of religion. Such a being is liable every moment to forget himself. Philosophy has provided against this by the laws of morality. Formed to live in society, he might forget his fellow creatures. Legislators have therefore by political and civil laws confined him to his duty. Chapter 2 Of the Laws of Nature Antecedent to the above-mentioned laws are those of nature, so-called because they derive their force entirely from our frame in existence. In order to have a perfect knowledge of these laws, we must consider man before the establishment of society. The laws received in such a state would be those of nature. The law which, impressing on our mind the idea of a creator, inclines us towards him, is the first in importance, though not in order, of natural laws. Man in a state of nature would have the faculty of knowing before he had acquired any knowledge. Plain it is that his first ideas would not be of a speculative nature. He would think of the preservation of his being before he would investigate its origin. Such a man would feel nothing in himself at first but impotency and weakness. His fears and apprehensions would be excessive as appears from instances, were there any necessity of proving it, of savages found in forests, trembling at the motion of a leaf and flying from every shadow. In this state, every man, instead of being sensible of his equality, would fancy himself inferior. There would therefore be no danger of their attacking one another. Peace would be the first law of nature. The natural impulse or desire which Hobbes attributes to mankind of subduing one another is far from being well founded. The idea of empire and dominion is so complex and depends on so many other notions that it could never be the first which occurred to the human understanding. Hobbes inquires, for what reason go men armed and have locks and keys to fasten their doors if they be not naturally in a state of war? But is it not obvious that he attributes to mankind before the establishment of society what can happen but in consequence of this establishment, which furnishes them with motives for hostile attacks and self-defense? Next, to a sense of his weakness, man would soon find that of his wants. Hence another law of nature would prompt him to seek for nourishment. Fear, I have observed, would induce men to shun one another, but the marks of this fear being reciprocal would soon engage them to associate. Besides, this association would quickly follow from the pleasure one an animal feels at the approach of another of the same species. Again, the attraction arising from the difference of sexes would enhance this pleasure, and the natural inclination they have for each other would form a third law. Beside the sense or instinct which man possesses in common with brutes, he has the advantage of acquired knowledge, and thence arises a second tie which brutes have not. Mankind have therefore a new motive of uniting, and a fourth law of nature results from the desire of living in society. Chapter 3 of Positive Laws As soon as man enters into a state of society, he loses the sense of his weakness equality ceases, and then commences the state of war. Each particular society begins to feel its strength, whence arises a state of war between different nations. 
the individual likewife of each fociety becomes fenfible of their force ; hence the principal advantages of this fociety they endeavour to convert to their own emolument, which conftitutes a ftate of war between individuals. Thefe two different kinds of ftates give rife to human laws. Confidered as inhabitants of fuch great a planet, which neceffarily contains a variety of nations, they have laws relating to their mutual intercourfe, which is what we call the law of nations. As members of a fociety that muft be properly fupported, they have laws relating to the governors and the governed ; and this we diftinguifh by the name of politic law. They have alfo another fort of law, as they ftand in relation to each other, by which is underftood the civil law. The law of nations is naturally founded on this principle, that different nations ought in time of peace to do one another all the good they can, and in time of war as little injury as poffible, without prejudicing their real interefts. The objeft of war is victory, that of victory is conqueft, and that of conqueft preservation. From this and the preceding principle, all thofe rules are derived which conftitute the law of nations. All countries have a law of nations, not excepting the Iraqis themfelves, though they devour their prifoners, for they fend and receive ambaffadors, and underftand the rights of war and peace. The mifchief is that their law of nations is not founded on true principles. Befides the law of nations relating to all focieties, there is a polity or civil conftitution for each particularly concerned. No fociety can fubfift without a form of government. The united ftrength of individuals, as Gravener well obferve, conftitutes what we call the body politic. The general ftrength may be in the hands of a fingle perfon or of many. Some think that nature having eftablifhed paternal authority, the moft natural government was that of a fingle perfon. But the example of paternal authority proves nothing. For if the power of a father relates to a fingle government, that of brothers after the death of a father, and that of cousins, German after the decease of brothers, refer to a government of many. The political power neceffarily comprehends the union of feveral families. Better is it to fay, that the government moft conformable to nature is that which best agrees with the humour and difpofition of the people in whofe favour it is eftablifhed. The ftrength of individuals cannot be united without a conjunction of all their wills. The conjunction of those wills, as Gravener again very juftly obferves, is what we call the civil state. Law in general is human reason, inasmuch as it governs all the inhabitants of the earth. The political and civil laws of each nation ought to be only the particular cases in which human reason is applied. They fhould be adapted in fuch a manner to the people for whom they are framed, that it fhould be a great chance if thofe of one nation fuit another. They fhould be in relation to the nature and principle of each government, whether they form it, as may be said of politic laws, or whether they fupport it, as in the cafe of civil institutions. They fhould be in relation to the climate of each country, to the quality of its foils, to its fituation and extent, to the principal occupation of the natives, whether husbandmen, huntsmen, or fhepherds. They fhould have relation to the degree of liberty which the conftitution will bear, to the religion of the inhabitants, to their inclinations, riches, numbers, commerce, manners, and cuftoms. In fine, they have relations to each other, as alfo to their origin to the intent of the legislator, and to the order of things on which they are eftablifhed, in all of which different lights they ought to be considered. This is what I have undertaken to perform in the following work. These relations I shall examine, since all these together constitute what I call the spirit of laws. I have not separated the political from the civil institutions, as I do not pretend to treat of laws, but of their spirit, and as this spirit confifts in the various relation which the laws may bear to different objects, it is not fo much my bufinefs to follow the natural order of laws, as that of thefe relations and objects. I fhall firft examine the relations which laws bear to the nature and principle of each government, and as this principle has a strong influence on laws, I fhall make it my ftudy to understand it thoroughly. 
and if I can but once eftablifh it, the laws will foon appear to flow thence as from their fources. I fhall proceed afterwards to other and more particular relations. End of chapter 3 and end of book 1 of The Spirit of Laws Book 2 of The Spirit of the Laws This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Benjamin Giddens The Spirit of the Laws by Charles II, Baron de Montesquieu Translated by Thomas Nugent Book Two of Laws Directly Derived from the Nature of Government Chapter One Of the Nature of the Three Different Governments There are three species of government, republican, monarchical, and despotic. In order to discover their nature, it is sufficient to recollect the common notion which supposes three definitions, or rather, three facts. That a republican government is that in which the body, or only a part of the people, is possessed of the supreme power. Monarchy, that in which a single person governs by a fixed and established laws. A despotic government, that in which a single person directs everything by his own will and comprise. That is what I call the nature of each government. We must now inquire into these laws, which directly conform to this nature, and consequently are the fundamental institutions. Chapter 2 of the Republican Government and the Laws in Relation to Democracy When the body of the people is possessed of the supreme power, it is called a democracy. When the supreme power is lodged in the hands of a part of the people, it is then an aristocracy. In a democracy, the people are in some respects the sovereign, and in others the subject. There can be no exercise of sovereignty but by the suffrages, which are their own will. Now the sovereign's will is the sovereign himself. The law, therefore, which establishes the right of suffrage, are fundamental to this government. And indeed, it is as important to regulate in a republic, in what manner, by whom, to whom, and concerning what, suffrages are to be given, as it is in a monarchy to know who is the prince, and after what manner he ought to govern. Libanaeus says that at Athens, a stranger who intermeddled in the assemblies of the people was punished with death. This is because such a man usurped the rights of sovereignty. It is an essential point to fix the number of citizens who are to form the public assemblies. Otherwise, it would be uncertain whether the whole or only a part of the people had given their votes. At Sparta, the number was fixed at 10,000. But Rome, designed by Providence to rise from the weakest beginnings to the highest pitch of grandeur, Rome, doomed to experience all the vicissitudes of fortune. Rome, who had sometimes all her inhabitants without her walls, and sometimes all Italy, and a considerable part of the world within them, Rome, I say, never fixed the number, and this was one of the principal causes of her ruin. The people in whom the supreme power resides ought to have the management of everything within their reach. That which exceeds their abilities must be conducted by their ministers. But they cannot properly be said to have their ministers without the power of nominating them. It is, therefore, a fundamental maxim in this government that the people should choose their ministers, that is, their magistrates. They have occasion, as well as monarchs, and even more so, to be directed by a council or senate. But to have a proper confidence in these, they should have the choosing of the members, whether the election be made by themselves, as at Athens, or by some magistrate deputed for that purpose, as on certain occasions was customary at Rome. The people are extremely well qualified for choosing those whom they are to entrust with part of their authority. They have only to be determined by things to which they cannot be strangers, and by facts that are obvious to sense. They can tell when a person has fought many battles, and been crowned with success. They are, therefore, capable of electing a general. 
they can tell when a judge is assiduous in office, gives general satisfaction, and has never been charged with bribery. This is sufficient for choosing a praetor. They are struck with the magnificence or riches of a fellow citizen. No more is requisite for electing an aedile. These are facts of which they can have better information in a public forum than a monarch in his palace. But are they capable of conducting an intricate affair, of seizing and improving the opportunity and critical moment of action? No, this surpasses their ability. Should we doubt the people's natural capacity in respect to the discernment of merit, we need only cast an eye on the series of surprising elections made by the Athenians and Romans, which no one surely will attribute to Hazard. We know that, though the people of Rome assumed the right of raising plebeians to public offices, yet they never would exert this power. And though at Athens the magistrates were allowed, by the law of Aristides, to be elected from all the different classes of inhabitants, there never was a case, says Xenophon, when the common people petitioned for employments which could endanger either their security or their glory. As most citizens have sufficient ability to choose, though unqualified to be chosen, so the people, though capable of calling others to an account for their administration, are incapable of conducting the administration themselves. The public business must be carried on with a certain motion, neither too quick nor too slow. But the motion of the people is always either too remiss or too violent. Sometimes with a hundred thousand arms they overturn all before them, and sometimes with a hundred thousand feet they creep like insects. In a populous state, the inhabitants are divided into certain classes. It is in the manner of making this division that great legislators have signalized themselves, and it is on this the duration and prosperity of democracy have ever depended. Servius Tullius followed the spirit of aristocracy in the distribution of his classes. We find in Livy and in Dionysus Halicarnassus in what manner he lodged the right of suffrage in the hands of the principal citizens. He had divided the people of Rome into 193 centuries, which formed six classes, and ranking the rich, who were in small numbers in the first centuries, and those in the middling circumstances, who were more numerous in the next, he flung the indigent multitude into the last. And as each century had but one vote, it was property rather than numbers that decided the election. Solon divided the people of Athens into four classes. In this he was directed by the spirit of democracy, his intention not being to fix those who were to choose, but such as were eligible. Therefore, leaving to every citizen the right of election, he made the judges eligible from each of those four classes, but the magistrates he ordered to be chosen only out of the first three, consisting of persons of easy fortunes. As the division of those who have a right of suffrage is a fundamental law in republics, so the manner of giving this suffrage is another fundamental. The suffrage by lot is natural to democracy, as that by choice is to aristocracy. The suffrage by lot is a method of electing that offends no one, but animates each citizen with the pleasing hope of serving his country. Yet as this method is in itself defective, it has been the endeavour of the most eminent legislators to regulate and amend it. Solon made a law at Athens that military employment should be conferred by choice, but that senators and judges should be elected by lot. The same legislator ordained that civil magistracies, attended with great expense, should be given by choice, and the others by lot. In order, however, to amend the suffrage by lot, he made a rule that none but those who presented themselves should be elected, and that the person elected should be examined by judges and that every one should have a right to accuse him if he were unworthy of the office. This participated at the same time of the suffrage by lot, and that of by choice. When the time of their magistracy had expired, they were obliged to submit to another judgment in regard to their conduct. Persons utterly unqualified must have been extremely backward in giving their names to be drawn by lot. The law which determines the manner of giving suffrage is likewise fundamental in a democracy. It is a question of some importance whether the suffrages ought to be public or secret. 
Cicero obferves that the laws, which rendered them fecret towards the clofe of the republic, were the caufe of its decline. But as this is differently pradifed in different republics, I fhall offer here my thoughts concerning this fubjeft. The people's fuffrages ought doubtlefs to be public, and this fhould be confidered as a fundamental law of democracy. The lower clafs ought to be directed by thofe of a higher rank, and reftrained within bounds by the gravity of eminent personages. Hence, by rendering the fuffrages fecret in the Roman republic, all was loft. It was no longer poffible to direft a populace that fought its own deftrudion. But when the body of the nobles are devote an aristocracy, or in a democracy the senate, as the bufinefs is then only to prevent intrigues, the fuffrage cannot be too fecret. Intriguing in a senate is dangerous. It is dangerous alfo in a body of nobles, but not fo among the people, whofe nature is to aft through paffion. In countries where they have no fhare in the government, we often fee them as much inflamed on account of an actor as ever they could be for the welfare of the ftate. The misfortune of a republic is when intrigues are at an end, which happens when the people are gained by bribery and corruption. In this case, they grow indifferent to public affairs, and avarice becomes their predominant passion. Unconcerned about the government and everything belonging to it, they quietly wait for their hire. It is likewise a fundamental law in democracies that the people should have the sole power to enact laws, and yet there are thousand occasions on which it is necessary the senate should have the power of decreeing, nay, it is frequently proper to make some trial of a law before it is established. The constitutions of Rome and Athens were excellent. The decrees of the senate had the force of laws for the space of a year, but did not become perpetual till they were ratified by the consent of the people. Chapter 3 Of the Laws in Relation to the Nature of Aristocracy In an aristocracy, the supreme power is lodged in the hands of a certain number of persons. These are invested both with the legislative and executive authority, and the rest of the people are, in respect to them, the same as the subjects of a monarchy in regard to the sovereign. They do not vote here by lot, for this would be productive of inconveniences only. And indeed, in a government where the most mortifying distinctions are already established, though they were to be chosen by lot, still they would not cease to be odious. It is the nobleman they envy, and not the magistrate. When the nobility are numerous, there must be a senate to regulate the affairs which the body of the nobles are incapable of deciding, and to prepare others for their decision. In this case it may be said that the aristocracy is in some measure in the senate, the democracy in the body of the nobles, and the people are a cipher. It would be a very happy thing in an aristocracy if the people, in some measure, could be raised from this state of annihilation. Thus at Genoa, the bank of St. George being administered by the people, gives them a certain influence in the government, whence their whole prosperity is derived. The senators ought by no means to have the right of naming their own members, for this would be the only way to perpetuate abuses. At Rome, which in its early years was a kind of aristocracy, the senate did not fill up the vacant places in their own body. The new members were nominated by the censors. In a republic, the sudden rise of a private citizen to the exorbitant power produces monarchy, or something more than monarchy. In the latter the laws have been provided for, or in some measure adapted themselves to the constitution, and the principle of government checks the monarch. But in a republic where a private citizen has obtained an exorbitant power, the abuse of this power is much greater because the laws foresaw it not, and consequently made no provision against it. There is an exception to this rule when the constitution is such as to have immediate need of a magistrate invested with extraordinary power. Such was Rome with her dictators, such is Venice with her state inquisitors. These are formidable magistrates, who restore, as it were by violence, the state to its liberty. But how come is it that these magistracies are so very different in these two republics? It is because Rome supported the remains of her aristocracy against the people, whereas Venice employs her state inquisitors to maintain her aristocracy against the nobles. The consequence was that at Rome, the dictatorship could be only of short duration, as the people acted through passion, and not with design. 
it was neceffary that a magiftracy of this kind fhould be exercifed with luftre and pomp, the bufinefs being to intimidate, and not to punifh the multitude. It was alfo proper that the diftator fhould be created only for fome particular affair, and for this only fhould have an unlimited authority, as he was always created upon fome fudden emergency. On the contrary, at Venice, they have occafion for a permanent magiftracy, for here it is that schemes may be fet on foot, continue, fufpended, and refumed, that the ambition of a fingle perfon becomes that of a family, and the ambition of one family that of many. They have occafion for a fecret magiftracy, the crimes they punifh being hatched in fecrecy and filence. This magiftracy muft have a general inquisition, for their bufinefs is not to remedy known diforders, but to prevent the unknown. In a word, the latter is designed to punifh fufpeded crimes, where the former ufed rather menaces than punifhment even for crimes that were openly avowed. In all magiftracies, the greatnefs of the power muft be compenfated by the brevity of the duration. This moft legiflators have fixed to a year. A longer space would be dangerous, and a shorter would be contrary to the nature of government. For who is it? that in the management even of his domestic affairs would be thus confined. At Ragusa, the chief magistrate of the republic is changed every month, the other officers every week, and the governor of the castle every day. But this can take place only in a small republic, environed by formidable powers, who might easily corrupt such petty and insignificant magistrates. The best aristocracy is that in which those who have no share in the legislature are so few and inconsiderable that the governing party have no interest in oppressing them. Thus, when Antipater made a law at Athens that whosoever was not worth two thousand drachmas should have no power to vote, he formed by this method the best aristocracy possible, because this was so small a sum as to exclude very few, and not one of any rank or consideration in the city. Aristocratic families ought, therefore, as much as possible, to level themselves in appearance with the people. The more an aristocracy borders on democracy, the nearer it approaches perfection, and in proportion as it draws towards monarchy, the more it is imperfect. But the most imperfect of all is that in which the part of the people that obeys is in a state of civil servitude to those who command, as the aristocracy of Poland, where the peasants are slaves to the nobility. Chapter 4 of the relation of laws to the nature of monarchical government. The intermediate, subordinate, and dependent powers constitute the nature of monarchical government. I mean of that in which a single person governs by fundamental laws. I said the intermediate, subordinate, and dependent powers. And indeed, in monarchies, the prince is the source of all power, political and civil. These fundamental laws necessarily suppose the intermediate channels through which the power flows. For if there be only the momentary and capricious will of a single person to govern the state, nothing can be fixed, and of course there is no fundamental law. The most natural, intermediate and subordinate power is that of the nobility. This in some measure seems to be essential to a monarchy, whose fundamental maxim is, no monarch, no nobility, no nobility, no monarch. But there may be a despotic prince. There are men who have endeavoured in some countries in Europe to suppress the jurisdiction of the nobility, not perceiving that they were driving at the very thing that was done by the Parliament of England. Abolish the privileges of the lords, the clergy, and cities in a monarchy, and you will soon have a popular state, or else a despotic government. The courts of a considerable kingdom in Europe have, for many ages, been striking at the patrimonial jurisdiction of the lords and clergy. We do not pretend to censure these sage magistrates, but we leave it to the public to judge how far this may alter the constitution. Far am I from being prejudiced in the favour of the privileges of the clergy, However, I should be glad if their jurisdiction were once fixed. The question is not whether their jurisdiction was justly established, but whether it be really established. 
whether it conftitutes a part of the laws of the country, and is in every refpeft in relation to thofe laws ; whether between two powers acknowledged independent, the conditions ought not to be reciprocal ; and whether it be not equally the duty of a good fubjeft to defend the prerogative of the prince, and to maintain the limits which from time immemorial have been prefcribed to his authority. Though the ecclefiaftic power be fo dangerous in a republic, yet it is extremely popular in a monarchy, efpecially of the abfolute kind. What would become of Spain and Portugal, fince the fubverfion of their laws, were it not for this only barrier againft the incurfions of arbitrary power? A barrier ever ufeful when there is no other, for fince a defpotic government is productive of the moft dreadful calamities to human nature, the very evil that restrains it is beneficial to the fubjeft. In the fame manner as the ocean, threatening to overflow the whole earth, is stopped by weeds and pebbles that lie scattered along the shore, so monarchs, whose power seems unbounded, are restrained by the fmalleft obftacles, and fuffer their natural pride to be fubdued by fupplication and prayer. The Englifh, to favour their liberty, have abolifhed all the intermediate powers of which their monarchy was compofed. They have a great deal of reafon to be jealous of this liberty. Were they ever to be fo unhappy as to lofe it, they would be one of the moft fervile nations upon earth. Mr. Law, through ignorance both of a republican and monarchical constitution, was one of the greateft promoters of abfolute power ever known in Europe. Befides the violent and extraordinary changes owing to his direction, he would fain fuppreft all the intermediate ranks and abolifh the political communities. He was diffolving the monarchy by his chimerical reimbursements, and feemed as if he even wanted to redeem the constitution. It is not enough to have intermediate powers in a monarchy. There muft be alfo a depository of the lords. This depository can only be the judges of the supreme courts of juftice, who promulgate the new laws and revive the obfolete. The natural ignorance of the nobility, their indolence and contempt of civil government, require that there fhould be a body invefted with the power of reviving and executing the laws, which would be otherwife buried in oblivion. The prince's council are not a proper depository. They are naturally the depository of the momentary will of the prince, and not of the fundamental laws. Besides, the prince's council is continually changing. It is neither permanent nor numerous. Neither has it sufficient share of the confidence of the people. Consequently, it is capable of setting them right in difficult conjunctures, or of reducing them to proper obedience. Despotic governments, where there are no fundamental laws, have no such kind of depository. Hence it is that religion has generally so much influence in these countries, because it forms a kind of permanent depository. And if this cannot be said of religion, it may of the customs that are respected instead of laws. Chapter 5 of the laws in relation to the nature of a despotic government. From the nature of despotic power, it follows that the single person, invested with this power, commits the execution of it also to a single person. A man whom his senses continually inform that he himself is everything, and that his subjects are nothing, is naturally lazy, voluptuous, and ignorant. In consequence of this, he neglects the management of public affairs. But were he to commit the administration to many, there would be continual disputes among them. Each would form intrigues to be his first slave, and he would be obliged to take the reins into his own hands. It is, therefore, more natural for him to resign it to a vizier, and to invest him with the same power as himself. For creation of a vizier is a fundamental law of this government. It is related of a pope that he had started an infinite number of difficulties against his election from a thorough conviction of his incapacity. At length, he was prevailed on to accept of the pontificate and resigned the administration entirely to his nephew. He was soon struck with surprise and said, I should never have thought that these things were so easy. The same may be said of the princes of the East, who, being educated in a prison where eunuchs corrupt their hearts and debase their understandings, 
and where they are frequently kept ignorant even of their high rank, when drawn forth in order to be placed on the throne, are at first confounded, but as soon as they have chosen a vizar, and abandoned themselves in the seraglio to the most brutal passions, pursuing in the midst of a prostituted course every capricious extravagance, they would never have dreamed that they could find matters so easy. The more extensive the empire, the larger the seraglio, and consequently the more voluptuous the prince. Hence, the more nations such a sovereign has to rule, the less he attends to the cares of government, the more important his affairs, the less he makes them the subject of his deliberations. End of chapter 4 End of Book 2 of Spirit of Laws